Welcome to the world of gut health and fasting. Today we're diving into something that's both fascinating and a bit under the radar. Goblet cells when it comes to fasting and especially dry fasting and how it all correlates with gut health. You've probably never heard of goblet cells in your life. They are an extremely niche part of the microbiome when it comes to gut health. There's really not that much research about them. I hope that after this discussion, you start to realize how important and what a key player they may be in this whole big picture. All in all, I hope you start to understand that the hundreds or thousands of pieces that equal the whole big puzzle that comprises our body are really hard to individually address, especially when so many of them may be out of sync. So let's dive into this talk about microbiome health, dehydration through dry fasting, and how all of this plays into gut health. So strap yourselves in. Welcome to the Dry Fasting Club. Please remember that all fasting should be done with medical supervision. All information provided here should be viewed as informational only and should never supersede medical advice. When you are adding fasting or making lifestyle and dietary changes, please discuss with your medical professional first. So ever heard of goblet cells? They're these nifty little cells in our intestines that actually produce mucus called mucin. But it isn't just slime. Think of it as a shield that protects our digestive system. It keeps our gut lining healthy and our gut flora thriving. It helps create the perfect environment for our good bacteria to thrive and for the bad ones to die out. So how do goblet cells play into this whole thing when it comes to fasting? During a dry fast, these goblet cells keep producing mucin, which in a environment of nutrient deprivation continues to provide a food source for our good bacteria. What happens to the bad ones that can't eat this food? Well, they starve and also dry out. A dry fast might even be able to supercharge our goblet cells. Think of it kind of in the same way that a liver flush is like a reset button for our liver and bile production. It's amazing that this process actually is able to flush out some bad bacteria. How? Well, we know that there are countless of studies out there that continuously show a microbiome improvement after fasting. Usually, it has to do with microbiome diversity. In fact, we even have one about Ramadan showing this exact scenario, but we'll get to that in a bit. Bad bacteria have learned to thrive on specific nutrients, especially glucose. Glucose is a nutrient that is abundant in most living organisms. And it makes sense for most bacteria that are trying to colonize as much as possible that they are going to adhere to this specific statistical playbook as well. So start to think about glucose as not just a nutrient for our own energy, but for most of life out there. What about our good bacteria though? Well, a lot of them have co-evolved with our bodies for thousands or millions of years, and they've adapted to being able to thrive on what goblet cells produce, these mucins. So let's not worry about our good bacteria because they'll be able to thrive for a longer time even in a lower glucose environment. Talking about gluconeogenesis and going down that rabbit hole is a little bit complicated and deep, but I'm not trying to say that we should not consume glucose because it is still one of the most important energy sources for our bodies and the most accessible one. But it's starting to look like taking a break and cleansing the microbiome is an important step from time to time and a powerful technique to keep in your back pocket. Enter goblet cells. Now let's talk about fasting and its impact on gut health, but not just any fasting, dry fasting specifically. This is where things get really interesting. When we fast, we're actually reshaping our gut microbiome like we just talked about. You're reducing the bacteria that are hogging all our microbiome space and not letting the other ones colonize. I like to think of this as a lawnmower that's just cutting the grass. So we're not really eliminating too much, we're just bringing everything back into balance. What this means is that we get to level the playing field and cut down the ones that are growing out of control. This allows for a more diverse gut microbiome, especially after the fast where all the magic starts to happen. 
So there's this study called the effects of Ramadan fasting on gut microbiome indicates a significant shift in the gut microbiota, especially an increase in the abundance of lactobacillus and bifidobacteria following fasting diets. The results of some studies also showed an increase in the bacterial diversity, decrease of inflammation, and increased production of some metabolites such as short-chain fatty acids. Additionally, Ramadan fasting improves health parameters through positive effects on some bacterial strains such as Acromantia bacteria. Nice. Now what about fiber and short-chain fatty acids specifically? So there's this study in the journal Cell, put it up right here, that talks about microbiome diversity. Human populations consuming fiber-rich diets have higher microbiota diversity relative to Western populations in which the intake of fiber is lower. And deeper into the study, if you dig in deeper, it talks about mice models. So in mice models with a low fiber diet, this decrease in gut biodiversity is associated with the extinction of bacterial taxa over multiple generations. Yikes. This is something to keep in mind when it comes to fiber-free diets over a long period of time. I don't know about you, but this is one of the reasons I've always been a little bit scared of going full carnivore, even though I've dabbled in it, but usually I approach it from a modified carnivore perspective, just like a modified zero-carb diet that includes some fibers, which are technically carbs. I've noticed that you can get near identical results uh, by hacking it a little bit and doing that modified carnivore um, and using things like green juice powders. And I personally use athletic greens to give you an idea. If I was looking for an alternative uh, or like a cheaper version, I'd probably look into something like juicing cucumbers, maybe throwing in celery and using it as like a morning drink. Just remember, this means that you're juicing the whole thing because we want to incorporate some form of fiber to feed that bacteria. Just the thought of wiping out my fiber and short-chain fatty acid producing bacteria worries me, as we see in the study it being eliminated from all future generations in the mice models. Let me know what you think without going too deep into the oxalate theory. What about the immune system when it comes to dry fasting? We know that fasting in general has a very positive effect on the immune system, barring certain conditions, complications, and maybe refeeding incorrectly. But dry fasting could be a game changer for your immune system, and with that, it could turbocharge our goblet cells. Dry fasting accelerates everything when it comes to fasting. So think of a water fast, just turbocharge it when you think about a dry fast. But it also adds dehydration that I always talk about. And this introduces a new form of autophagy that you cannot get anywhere else. You can see that there are actually multiple studies that are now exploring this thing called hyperosmotic stress inducing new autophagy. Just imagine it. Better autophagy means better immunity, which equals healthier goblet cells. This means more mucins get created. Remember, these mucins have evolved, co-evolved to coexist with our beneficial bacteria. The end result is that our gut becomes a paradise for them. Okay, so let's dive into some more fascinating studies on this topic. So studies show that diets rich in fiber lead to a more diverse microbiome. But here's the kicker. Fasting, particularly dry fasting, seems to supercharge the bacteria that produce short-chain fatty acids. What this means is that after a dry fast, when you're refeeding, especially with fiber-rich foods, you really turbocharge the good bacteria that you want. Think of it like rocket fuel for them. Now let's dive into the potential benefits of all of this. There is a synergy between butyrate and beta-hydroxybutyrate. Beta-hydroxybutyrate is produced in large quantities during fasting, while butyrate is maintained by a healthy, short-chain fatty acid-producing bacteria colony. Remember this. Like I mentioned earlier, we notice that on fiber-free diets, we may lose the ability to gain these benefits over time and lose the ability to digest fiber more efficiently. This can lead to mood regulation issues that can only be kept in check by continuing a ketogenic state indefinitely. 
The problem here is that you're always in a state of ketosis. You will deal with electrolyte issues and possible bone density issues, not to mention potential stress over time. The key? Balance. Use ketosis and fasting as powerful tools, not permanent fixtures. The best things in life should always include harmony and balance. This includes balanced growth not just in our physical bodies, but also in our mind and spiritually. My best recommendation in these scenarios is to use the ketogenic diet or these zero-carb diets as a tool rather than a lifestyle. But I may be wrong, and if you're consuming enough exogenous butyrate on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe you can keep that health going for a lot longer. Who knows? But once again, balance is everything. I pray you all focus on and are able to find that in your life. If you're out of balance, you need to take steps to correct it. It's a long journey, but fasting and dry fasting especially are a really powerful helper to help you along the way. Okay, let's talk about fasting durations really quickly. I think this is an important topic to cover before we wrap things up. How long should you fast for optimal gut health? That's the million dollar question. No one knows the exact answer here. That's why sticking to a very powerful, but not overly extended, five day dry fast is my preferred go to method. By entering the fast from a low carb prep, you're actually getting additional benefits and you get to jumpstart the ketosis faster. It also allows you to incorporate fiber into that prep as long as you're doing it from a very low carb source, something like cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, things like that. You can essentially produce an extra 48 hour effect this way, which would mean that a five-day dry fast can have the equivalent power of a seven-day dry fast coming in from a higher-carb diet. And what about risks? Fasting for too long, too many times, and without refeeding and recolonizing your gut bacteria may have a similar effect to not eating fiber for months or years. What do I mean by this? Well, you may enter a state that potentially makes you permanently lose some gut microbiome diversity. How do I deal with this? The answer is maintaining a low carb diet, but still incorporating low carb greens juices with some fiber. Like I just said, eating things like broccoli and cauliflower, maybe celery and cucumber. But what about the risks of never having any fructose or starches? And I know a lot of you who are on this zero carb journey have learned to demonize fructose. Well, this may be something that you try to mitigate. What you can do in some of these situations is to anticipate sometimes indulging in some of these foods by taking things like berberine, a supplement that's going to keep your blood glucose levels steady. And of course, I'm not talking about refined sugars and sweets. I'm specifically talking about fruits and starchy vegetables. Pretending that there's nothing that we need or that it's perfectly safe to completely eliminate them from our diet and lose the bacteria capacity to even digest that food is crazy. There are also potential risks to your cells losing the ability to use glycolysis, and that means digest sugar. And what this means is that if your body and cells are constantly in ketosis, they start to only adapt to ketolysis, and that's using ketones. They actually start to lose the ability to digest sugar. You might think this is a fine trade-off, but it goes pretty deep that we're not really going to talk about today. And I personally want my cells comfortable in using both sources of energy. Okay, so what's your take on goblet cells, dry fasting, and gut health? Do you have gut issues that you're trying to heal? Maybe you've been able to improve your microbiome with dry fasting. Drop your thoughts in the comments below. Maybe you've got some tips to help others out. Let's keep this conversation going and learn from each other. I wish you the very best on your healing journey. Good luck. Thanks for sticking around. If you've dry fasted before, have any questions or requests for future topics, please leave them in the comments below. I always check the comments for inspiration and ideas. If you're looking for a chat or to set up your dry fasting plan, check out the dryfastingclub.com website and subscribe. You should also check out the Discord community where you can meet other new and experienced dry fasters. Remember, 
No two people are the same, so every fasting experience is unique. Thank you, and good luck on your dry fasting journey.